Welcome to the Permaculture Magazine YouTube channel. I'm Maddie Harland and this is the second part of my conversation with Pippa Chapman, the author of The Plant Lover's Backyard Forest Garden. Today we talk about Pippa's favourite combination of plants, her gold star show mini forest garden at Harrogate Flower Festival, the importance of growing plants for joy and beauty as well as food and how to encourage your children into the garden. Tell me a little bit about your favourite plants. Um, I'm, I'm really interested. I mean, you, you mentioned just some really simple plants and something that we did, one of the first things we did, even while we were observing, we had an area that was like a raised bed area for, for veg and herbs and some flowering plants. And I, I started planting culinary herbs because I thought this is I can always move them if this isn't the right place but um, we need them now you know I can't really wait to grow them till I've designed a garden so like you've just said that's exactly what I did I planted lemon balm and thymes and you know plants for the kitchen and plants for tea and that was I felt like oh I can do that without making big decisions and indeed, I've just moved a couple of thyme plants this spring um, because they weren't in the right place ultimately. But what, what? Tell me a few of your favourites. That, but let's start with ground cover. What what sort of plants do you find yourselves turning to? What did you use in your Har Harrogate show garden, <laughs> for example? Because you won best um, of show, didn't you? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah, it was fantastic, fantastic. that uh, the forest gardening um, was, yeah, that was was show winning because really I created the garden to um, to show people forest gardening, to show people that it can be beautiful. And I certainly wasn't um, creating the show garden to win a prize. So it was just fantastic that um, it was seen that forest gardens can be beautiful as well. Uh, so uh, the, the show garden was a bit biased towards things that flower in the spring because obviously <laughs> you want everything in the garden to look fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. But some of the favourite plants that I put in there are things like um, a juga reptans, so bugle, and that has um, beautiful sort of purpley, coppery coloured leaves and you can get variegated ones and things as well. And you can eat, you can eat the leaves. Um, and it's not the tastiest um, leaf <laughs> vegetable that there is, but they have uh, blue flowering spikes, which the bees absolutely love. So that was one of my absolute favourites. And I think in a way, there's just so many plants that are my favourites that what I tend to find is that I end up with um, favorite combinations so things that I plant together time and time again um, alpine strawberries I mean they're just they're fantastic they can get a bit invasive if you're trying to grow them around other um, plants such as thyme which doesn't really like to be smothered but if you're looking at something that'll just fill a gap um, underneath shrubs and things like that alpine strawberries are just one of my my favorite go-to plants partly just because they're so easy to grow and you still get a crop of strawberries so uh, that's definitely one of my favorites and a more recent favorite is um the siberian bellflower so campanula porsca por i can never say it properly porscoyana i think it's called um siberian bellflower and actually all campanulas have edible leaves and flowers um but this one has actually tasty leaves which i think is one of the things in forest gardening is that we really struggle to find um things that are really tasty you know i think you can over time you can train yourself to enjoy more um bitter flavors um but actually the campanula leaves if you get them in the spring um winter and spring um, the the leaves sorry taste really just like lettuce so not a too strong a flavor um that's one of my favorites too <laughs> as I say so many favorites it's it's more about um yeah favorite combinations so those those three will grow really quite well together and uh, in terms of shrubs what I mean you have mentioned gooseberries and they are wonderful wonderful plants because they'll grow in shade um and produce in shade indeed but what else do you like to plant and eat? Um, so I really love um, lots of the Eleagnus. 
So they, you know, they're fantastic because um, a lot of them are evergreen. So that's fantastic always for habitat. Um, some of them, particularly like Umbelata um, and the um, Eliagna sabingii, have just heavenly scented flowers. They just smell mm. absolutely amazing. Mm. There's one um, at the Ecology Building Society at the moment where I work. And um, every time I walk past it, it's just amazing. It's been flowering for a good few weeks now. And so that's that's a really fantastic one. And it has um, the berries as well. Um, and then things like wine berries uh, and yeah. I think wine berries can they can get quite big and unruly but um there's something about you know one one of the things that I love about certain plants that makes them my favorites are just um combination of like colors and textures so just like they're really you know, like spiky stems that are sort of almost glow purple in the sunshine you know it's things like that that, that make me really love certain plants more than others and um, and some will, you know, have really, really tasty fruit and some will have other really useful functions as well. So like the Eliagnus, it's not my favourite fruit, but mm -hmm. it fixes nitrogen and it provides great habitat. So that's really important. You, you don't want everything just to be all the time about, you know, the about fruit or or something you can eat. You know, they, you want to look at other functions as well. But it, things like the wine berries are fantastic. And one of my all-time favourites um, is japonica as well, so Chinomalies japonica, and the fruits are um, just have a really amazing um, sort of citrusy aromatic smell. So I will even put some in a bowl in the kitchen just just to be able to smell the fruit, um, almost like you know natural potpourri. Um, but also you can make uh, fruit and put them in fruit leathers or make like a jam or jelly from it. And um, we once made a, I think it was wild pear and japonica drizzling sauce um, for ice wow. cream that was delicious. And the wow. flowers are beautiful as well. So this time of year, they're just, you know, they're flowering um, and they look beautiful, really colourful, great for um, pollinators. So, yeah, I think it's a combination of um, being really useful in some way, um, but also being really beautiful. So I think one thing that you learn in, when you're doing um, ornamental horticulture is it's all about um, colours and textures. Um, so, uh, you know, not everything just not being the same within the garden. So um, that's sort of how I decide if a plant has a really different texture or coloured leaf to um, the average shrub you know so like gooseberries and black currants and things they're really useful but they're not the most attractive standout plant in the garden so it's nice to have a mix of both yeah exactly exactly and it's nice to take from um or the ornamental tradition but find that they're edible uh, as well as beautiful or with a fabulous scent or creating you know good habitat or something and and sort of bring them into the food forest well for in particular um, at the um, Harrogate flower show one of the things I did was create some labels so that I could label I didn't label every single plant but the things that I thought people wouldn't realize were edible so things like the hostas um yes. you know I put a label and on the label I wrote hosta edible shoots um yes. and it was it was really funny because when I got my feedback from the judges one of the things that they said was um that they didn't think I was lying but they did actually have to google <laughs> to check whether that was true because they didn't yeah. believe me yeah. so I think there's there are a lot of plants um that I've used in in horticulture before I got um got into forest gardening um, that I didn't realise at the time were edible. So things like the the campanulas, um, hostas, bugle, and um, you know things like that. Camassia are one of my most favourite plants, and they're just looking absolutely fantastic at the moment. And they have these spectacular blue flowers. And whenever people come on garden tours, um, they're always really asking me straight away, "Oh, what's that?" You know, they've not not seen it before. They don't know what it is. Um, and that was one of the main plants that I used at the Harrogate Flower Show. Um, it took me a long time to get it to flower because it was a good couple of weeks earlier than it would normally flower. And we've had a very cold spring. So there was lots of bringing it into the porch to, to get it, you know, hopefully flowering early, but then worrying it would be flowering too soon. So taking it out again. And 
that wasn't much fun but it, it's a fantastic um beautiful bulb and it's so easy to grow because it is a bulb so you just you know just like you would tulips or daffodils you buy them as bulbs you plant them in the ground um and then they'll come up and flower uh, and you can eat you can eat the bulbs of those so um you can bake them um and eat them like a bit like you would with potato something like that but in all honesty they're so beautiful that I think you'd really be hard pressed to dig them up and eat them because they're just so pretty <laughs> and you don't need to lift them they're hardy are they yes yes they're fully hardy yes oh that's yeah. amazing yeah. to get mm. something that beautiful and edible but like you say you don't really want to eat them because they're so good <laughs> No, um, but then when things are like that, I like to think, well, they they are good for pollinators. And I, I really think as well that when I first started out in forest gardening, I was really um, trying to stick really strictly to everything being edible or yes. fixing nitrogen or, yes. you know, uh, serving a purpose. And uh, and there were a couple of plants that I really wanted to put in the garden, but I thought, oh, I just they don't have a function. I can't possibly use them. But now I, I see now over time that actually just the joy of having a beautiful plant in your garden is another function and not to be afraid to just think, oh, I just really love this plant and I would just really like to put it in my garden because of how it looks. And you may later find that it's fantastic for pollinators or, you know, you can turn it into a twine or, you know, you might find there's another function. But even if you don't, and you just want it because it's beautiful, that is absolutely fine. And there's no need to think just because you're creating a forest garden that you have to immediately um, stop growing all of your favourite um, plants. You know, that it, I think it has to be a space that you enjoy, that you want to be in and that you, you um, find pleasurable to garden. So I think it's just as important to add things in because you like the look of them. Well, you know, we grow roses here and we have inherited a lot of roses, but I love them. And I know I can make, you know, they're edible and I can make things out of them. But I just love them because I love them and I love <laughs> them well. And, and so, you know, we, we haven't taken any out um, and we've put, indeed, we've spent a lot of time pruning them so that they're really come into really good heart this year and the other thing we've inherited is Christmas roses and I don't think that there's any particular forest garden advantage to them except that they like shade which is quite useful but again that that you know so early in the year that they're blooming and and I think they're rather beautiful and they fill you know they fill a space very early before everything else has grown so I'm sort of at the stage where I'm I am planting edibles, but I've inherited an or mainly ornamental garden that I'm I'm just looking at and thinking, well, I'll move some of the ornamental plants, but I'm not I'm not going to get rid of the irises, um, <laughs> the lilies because they're very beautiful and the bees love them as well. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, and. I I yes. think there's things like um, some of the spring bulbs as well, things like crocus, you know, they come up oh, really yeah. early in the year and they're really fantastic for bees. Oh, always on a sunny day in early spring when the crocus come out, you know, they're just absolutely buzzing um, with life. Uh, so oh. even things that you wouldn't necessarily think of as being um, a plant for pollinators, you know, something like crocus. And like you say, the hellebores that, uh, they're really important because they're flowering at a time of year when there really isn't very much else flowering. So I think it's really important. Something that I very much brought over to when I'm designing my forest gardens that I learned when I was designing um, ornamental gardens is that year round interest. And it's not just year round interest because it looks nice, but it's year round interest for food, for insects, for birds, you know, all sorts of different things, things that, produce seeds like teasels um, mm. even I um, uh, read somewhere the other day that verbena bonariensis which is a really beautiful flower and um, that that has seed that the birds really love so you know it's all about getting that year-round food source mm. um, both for yourself but also for wildlife as well yeah well I must confess to being a galanthophile and I <laughs> plant and split Snow drops every year precisely for that reason partly because it's sort of joyful to see flowers so early in the year and also because bees love them mm. and I love all the different um 
variations that you get <laughs> <laughs> yes I think that's that's one thing that um for a while as I said I think I kind of felt like the forest gardening had to be purely about it being edible and functional and I think um just over the last maybe four or five years since bringing some of that ornamental side and just joy of plants and 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 flowers bringing that back into forest gardening I, I feel has actually helped me to um sort of sell it to other people really as a, a as a, a feasible way of growing food in their own gardens at home because we want our home gardens to look beautiful that's where we spend most of our time outdoors you know when when we're at home is in our own gardens and it's when people have come and um and seen our yard in particular um at our previous home and just seen what a what a beautiful space it can be as well as being edible and that's when people have sort of said oh actually could you could you come to my garden and advise me on how to create something similar so I think you know it's just taking that that joy of, of flowers and and gardening and um, otherwise it looks into like an, an allotment you know, <laughs> an old-fashioned allotment you know it it, it it's like a, a sort of perennial equivalent of that old-fashioned way of regimented gardening where it all has to be edible in a, in a certain design and yeah I totally agree with you I think it's so important to to mix up and and have beautiful plants as well as just purely functional edible crop yielding plants and I do think that forest gardening or food forests as a movement has moved on enormously in in the last few years and certainly a decade or more ago permaculture gardens tended to be rather drab and I, I see now that they're becoming this, you know, you look at, say, someone like Steph Hafferty's vegetable garden, and there's just this fabulous mix of polycultures going on and flowering plants next to annuals and perennials, and somehow she manages to balance them all and, and grow them all together. And um, Liz Zorab does that as well and lets things volunteer and self-seed. And so it's much less re regimented. But but when we take those, you know, sides of the raised beds away and really relax and, and let it go and become more like a, a naturalistic ornamental garden design, that's when I think it you suddenly move into this area of, of beautiful garden design. And and like you say, the the habitat and the pollinators and and the edible yields all mix together, and you you've got a beautiful and very robust garden as well. Mm, absolutely, and and I think just um, simple tricks that you can do because one of the things with forest gardens um and I know I've had this because when I visited forest gardens, often you want to try and take a photographs you know when you're there and you think wow what a, a, an amazing polyculture this is fantastic and you take a picture and then when you look at it later you can't distinguish anything from anything it's else green. it's all just green um, <laughs> yeah. so just things like um try and find some purple leaves you know so at a forest garden I've just um planted at, at Eshalt Hall Gardens a Yorkshire water site uh, near Bradford and there I very specifically wanted to choose things like purple leaved hazel and purple leaved elders, you know, just things with um, different coloured leaves, you know, a very simple thing, but straight away it makes such a massive difference to have um, those different coloured foliage and you start to be able to distinguish one plant from another instead of just a sea of green. Uh, and little things like... Um, if you want to have a habitat pile or a log pile, you know, if you want to do something artistic, then you can. It doesn't just have to be a messy pile of logs in a corner, which is great for wildlife, but it's just as good for wildlife if you, you know, um, I don't know if you've um, seen Nigel Dunnett's log piles. So he's got like these big waves um, that he's created out of logs, you know, fantastic habitat, but really sculptural. And he's created... Um, like circles and areas using the log pile almost as a wall around the edge you know so creating lots of habitat but doing it in a way that 
that creates a lot of atmosphere and and um uh, within your garden you know to be a bit playful um i've just been creating a stone spiral so it's a habitat pile of rocks but i've just done it so that it spirals round um to create you know a nice feature within the garden just to add a bit more interest so i think just um yeah just about bringing some of those fun and creative elements into the forest garden as well so you'd feel it doesn't have to be um quite so wild you know it, it can be more garden like and I, and I also noticed that you've been designing and planting a mandala garden yes <laughs> so that, you know it's not just you know so it's got this structural and sculptural dimension yes I've had so much fun designing that um I wanted to create a teaching space so you know I think what's really great at the moment is um, that the idea of forest gardening is is spreading so much you know more people have heard of it now um, but, but there's still that sort of feeling that people don't know where to get started yes. so this this mandala forest garden is all about it being a teaching space so I wanted to start in the middle with a uh, a gathering space really so this space can be used for bringing people together to talk about forest gardening it might be people come to sit around a, a fire pit and whittle spoons you know to, but to create this really lovely circular space that is wrapped around by a forest garden and it's split into segments as well and each segment has a different function so People often talk about oh, well, food forests and forest gardening are the same thing. But I think actually forest gardening can be about more than that. So food forests obviously are about food, um, but there yeah. can be lots of other functions for forest gardens as well. So I've um, recently helped someone um, with uh, their medicinal food, medicinal forest gardening. And uh, Eshalt, one of the sections is all about plants for um, weaving, for creating basketry, for creating oh. twines, um, natural dye plants for doing that, you know, dyeing and, and things like that. So there can be all these other functions as well. So the part of the, the plan with this mandala forest garden was just to show all the different things that you can do with forest gardens it doesn't have to be all about food you know it, it, there's one that's that's more specifically about plants for pollinators and and wildlife habitats and things like that so it's a really lovely space I'm just going to be starting doing some teaching in it this spring it's a very new forest garden <laughs> we've only just planted it up but it's just been so much fun to to design all these different elements within it um, and to create this this circular forest garden um, that as it grows will feel a bit more like a, a lovely um, sort of hug of a forest garden to be in yeah. the middle at the moment it's still you know everything's all very tiny but that's the plan um, is to just feel this um, feeling like this forest garden wrapping all around you. Lovely. Tell, tell me how do you how do you integrate kids into gardening how do you engage your kids and, and other kids with gardening and keep their interest and and uh, not possibly alienate them by you know, <laughs> how it is as a parent when you really love something sometimes your kids can think oh not again yeah <laughs> you know, what do you do to keep your kids engaged uh, well, it was almost easier when they were smaller, really. I know that sound. It was harder to get anything done when they were smaller. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, they would come out and splash in water or, you know, they'd dig a hole. Um, and also we, we sort of integrated their own interests into the garden. And so as they're getting a bit older, that, you know, gets a bit more tricky. Like my youngest is really into coding. Well, it's a bit hard to, you know, do that whilst in the garden. But um, you know, we used to create uh, wigwams um, to grow beans and things up, but th there'd also be a den inside. So it's about trying to integrate their interests. So now um, my daughter, she really loves reading and writing. So we're sort of designing in a, a reading area, uh, you know, a little corner within the garden. And I think that um, they've always been really interested in helping sowing seeds and picking things and and that's been fantastic 
Um, but I think really for us, it's been just as much about them being outside and being in the garden and um, being within nature, you know, just having some reason for them to come out. And I think in a way, when they were younger, we had to um, split our time. So I know there's this whole um, principle of integrate, don't segregate. But sometimes, <laughs> actually, you achieve more by sort of... Um, segregating your time so we would have time when we were concentrating on just being with the children and enjoying the garden and actually achieving something <laughs> in the garden yeah. and those were usually two separate things and, and so I think in a way that would be more successful because if you try and achieve too much particularly when your children are really small um, you just get frustrated because you can't get on with it and they get frustrated because they don't really have your attention so I think it works much better if you can sort of have time where um, you're just playing, creating a den, having a picnic, um, sowing seed that it doesn't really matter if they mess it all up and you have to do it all again. Um, and then and then having some other time to yourself where you can actually um, get on and achieve the things that you want to do. But for us now, you know, over time, and this is why, you know, in permaculture, we're constantly um changing the garden you know you don't just create one garden and that's it you know you're constantly tweaking uh, making adjustments making changes and so as the children are getting nearer to teenage years now you know we're looking at different different ways to integrate what they enjoy doing in the garden so we're making more of a a feature of the fire pit area because there's nothing more fun than you know burning things <laughs> setting things on fire um, and uh, they love like whittling that kind of activity so it's just as much about having activities that they enjoy doing in the garden even if it's not um, planting seeds and you know weeding and mulching and things like that uh, I mean they've helped a lot with the new garden um, cutting down hedges and moving big branches and things like that um, but I think you know as they get to a certain age um, they want to be less and less involved in things that you really enjoy doing. <laughs> so it's just about creating spaces that they can enjoy. Yeah, and things like sitting around a fire pit when when you've got teenagers and they can go and hang out with their friends and, you know, be there and have a fire is is really special for them. And certainly that was what we we designed an area in our in our forest garden where they could go and put up a tent and um, just get away from the parents basically they <laughs> gardening but they they liked hanging out in the garden and they certainly um, always picked the you know particularly the fruit and the berries were particularly popular and and I found that from an early age they started cooking so they they were naturally you know when they were little they were naturally harvesters of of berries and and um you know beans and things like that but uh, as they got older they they became much more interested in bringing the stuff into the house and cooking and they've both ended up as gardeners um now being grown up adult women and and they're both really good cooks as well and really inventive oh, fantastic and i'm sure it's because they grew up in a forest garden with japanese wine berries and all sorts of interesting plants and meddlers and i don't know all sorts of ground cover and shrubs that that you wouldn't find in a supermarket yeah that sounds wonderful <laughs> yes yeah. i think we we feel very lucky you know to have had a fantastic garden for the for the kids to grow up in you know we, we've just downsized from sort of living in within five acres um most of that rewilded land um and we've now downsized to a well i say average size garden it, it's quite a decent size garden really but i, I feel very um, grateful that the kids had all that wilderness and wild space to roam around in while they were younger um and and so now we're kind of trying to concentrate some of the activities so we used to you know walk up a hill to have a fire pit up there and um you know we used to have the polytunnel in an, in another area and now we're kind of bringing all of those same activities <laughs> but into a smaller space um yeah. so yeah that we we had a, a sit down when we first moved in and we were sat around a fire burning some of the um, rubbish and 
woodwormed furniture from, <laughs> from the house uh, and we were you know we were discussing what do we want from the garden you know we had our own little mini survey um family survey of what do we want from the garden um, so wise to do that so wise to engage and even if you're not going well you have had help but even if it's not yes <laughs> primary role but I mean, you have, I'm fascinated for following all the things that you're doing. And, and I do follow you on social media. So I do know that you moved an enormous pile of logs <laughs> this week <laughs> and that you've replaced the ceilings in your house and you're, you're doing so many different things. So if anyone wants to follow you, where do they look? Um, I post most stuff on Instagram, so I do use Facebook a bit, but I, I, I'm constantly putting stuff on, on Instagram. I think I'm just constantly doing things um, in, in different jobs than at home uh, that I just really like to share. So on Instagram, um, that's where I post most of my things. And we also have a YouTube channel, which we are still we keep saying going to resurrect it I've done loads of filming I haven't actually edited it all together yet but hopefully now that um the flower show and things like that are over I've got a bit of a pause of time where I can put things together so we will start to release things um on YouTube which will be a mixture of us creating our new garden and how to do a survey of what you've got um, and sort of some of the uh, design processes that we go through to to design the garden and then and then creating it you know and then observing it over time uh, and and within that there'll be a few videos of the mandala forest garden at Eshalt and the um, garden the ecology building society as well so i'd like to feature a, a range of things <laughs> Yeah, and in between all of this, you're also writing another book. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I know. I did say after the last one, however much I really did enjoy it, I thought afterwards, oh, I'll have a big break now before I, you know, think about writing another one. But then almost within a few days, you're sort of thinking, oh, actually, I've got this idea and I've got that idea. And you start taking notes and then before you know it, you're into <laughs> writing the next one. <laughs> fantastic and um, yeah I really invite other people uh, the listeners and viewers here to um, check out the uh, the plant lovers backyard forest garden it's so enabling and there's so much about it defining forest gardens talking about all the different layers and herbaceous plants it's packed with photographs there's very much an emphasis on de designing a small garden not some massive food for forest you cover polycultures and guilds and how to combine plants very much the essence of what we've talked about today and you talk about all sorts of practical stuff about maintenance and planning and then lovely things like the natural the, the, the soil food web and you know fertility and propagation there's so much in here it's really packed and and I love it I mean here's a page just an example of the sort of photography as well it's it's not just lots and lots of words it's all living examples from your own garden um it's really brilliant so I can't wait to see the next book although no <laughs> hurry Pippa <laughs> <laughs> however you know it's exciting so thank you so much today and congratulations for taking forest gardening to Harrogate and <laughs> impressing the judges so you've got a best of show that's wonderful and um, I really look forward to seeing what you're up to next fantastic it's been a pleasure chatting thanks so much I'm